Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And good morning it is. Thank you uh, to uh, the, our co-chairs of our Syrian Policy Committee, Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro and Congressman George Miller, uh, for bringing us together uh, this morning to talk about an issue of primary interest around the kitchen tables of America, and that is the issue of Medicare. Uh, so important is this issue uh, that we have come back in this week, which was scheduled to be a week in session, and Democrats are here to work for the American people, uh, but the Republicans have walked out. Uh, they have tried to silence our voices on the floor, uh, but nonetheless, they will not silence our voices in this room. But this isn't about Democrats or Republicans, it's about Medicare. And that's why I'm so pleased that this morning we're joined by so many of our members, even though Congress is not in session, uh, because we are here to get the job done. And I want to especially acknowledge that we're joined by our distinguished Democratic whip, Mr. Hoyer, our distinguished assistant leader, Mr. Clyburn, uh, Mr. Quayar, member of the leadership, as well as our co-chairs, uh, Mr. Miller and uh, Chairwoman DeLauro and so many other members, Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, in whose district we are, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, Congressman Bobby Scott, Congressman Pete Stark, champion on Medicare, Congresswoman Donna Edwards, Congressman Rush Holt, Congresswoman Judy Chu, Congresswoman Allison Schwartz, other members who will be joining us in the course of the morning. The Republicans left town, uh, but they, didn't, uh, uh, they did so voting for the sixth time to repeal the Medicare guarantee. They found enough time to do that, not enough time to create jobs or middle income tax cut or Violence Against Women Act, pass the Farm Bill, any of that, but enough time to vote for the sixth time to uh, sever the Ma Medicare guarantee. Six times to set costing seniors, seniors, those of us who are 65 and over, $6,400 more while they give tax breaks of $160,000 to people making over a million dollars a year. That's the Ryan Rob Romney Republican budget. Voting to give seniors a voucher, putting them at the mercy of the health insurance company, taking us back, turning back the clock to pre-Medicare days. Uh, that's what they voted to do. Don't take my word for it, AARP said that the Republican plan, quote, is likely to simply increase costs for beneficiaries while removing Medicare's promise of secure health coverage, a guarantee that future seniors have contributed to, to through a lifetime of work. People are contributing four years to this, and now it will be gone. Uh, we Democrats, on the other hand, uh, created Medicare, we have sustained Medicare, and strengthened it, and we will always protect Medicare. Today, we're going to hear from Americans about the importance of Medicare in their lives and to their families, and we're going to hear from experts about saving Medicare for seniors today and in the future. Uh, I'm now pleased to yield to the distinguished chair of the Steering Policy Committee, Congresswoman Rose. Oh, first we're going to hear from our distinguished, you will yield to our distinguished whip, uh, Mr. Hoyer. I will uh, uh, yield. And then we thank him for joining us today. Yeah. I will yield back to you in just a minute. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Leader Pelosi and the co-chairs of uh, the steering committee, George Miller and Rosa DeLauro, for scheduling this hearing. I also want to thank uh, Ms. Stein and Ms. Davis and Mr. Wilmowski and uh, Ms. Davis Darrell for being with us uh, today. I appreciate this opportunity to discuss the dangerous impact of the Ryan Romney Republican House budget on Medicare and the positive impact of the Affordable Care Act that we passed in 2010. After the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression, Americans are still working very hard to make ends meet and pursue their opportunities promised by the American dream. Before we enacted the health reform, seniors and those nearing retirement faced an environment of uncertainty and rising costs. But thanks to the Affordable Care Act, Medicare beneficiaries can breathe a little easier today. Not only are a host of preventive services like mammograms and colonoscopies available without cost, uh, but the donut hole is closing and the Medicare Trust Fund will be solvent for an additional eight years. A report from the Department of Health and Human Services released last week shows the progress health reform has made. It found that the average American with traditional Medicare will save $5,000 from 2010 to 22 
as a result of the Affordable Care Act. Moreover, those who have had high prescription drug costs will save more than 18,000 during that same period. In the first eight months of this year alone, over 19 million Americans have accessed at least one free preventive service that used to cost beneficiaries. Uh, since the Affordable Care Act was enacted, more than five and a half million Americans have saved nearly $4.5 billion on prescription drugs as a result of the closing of the donut hole. The Ryan Romney Republican budget, however, would gut these reforms and place more of the cost burden onto the backs of our seniors than ever before. Not only would it defund the new benefits included in the Affordable Care Act, but it would end Medicare as we know it by instituting a voucher system. Their budget would leave seniors on Medicare paying over $6,000 a year out of pocket in health care costs, according to the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office. And the Ryan Romney Republican plan isn't ending Medicare in order to, to balance the budget. Their budget doesn't balance until 2040. But to afford huge tax breaks for millionaires and billionaires. So the Medicare cuts that they proposed are not going to reduce the deficit, uh, but going to reduce the tax obligation of the richest in America. That's simply wrong. That's the wrong approach and one that fails American seniors. In fact, a study out today by the nonpartisan Commonwealth Fund shows that the Romney Ryan health care policies would leave as many as 45 million more Americans uninsured over the next decade compared with the Affordable Care Act and the President's policies. Okay. Um, Madam Leader and uh, Madam Chair, Chair and uh, Mr. Chair, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I look forward to this hearing and hearing from our distinguished witnesses. We are here to work to make sure that Medicare remains a guarantee for all our seniors and their families to give them security uh, and the future that they hoped for and expected. And I yield now to the distinguished chairwoman, uh, Ms. DeLauro. Thank you very much, um, um, Mr. Hoyer. Uh, let me just say a welcome to all, and uh, I want to thank our leader Pelosi for calling this important hearing. I'm pleased to join with my colleague, Mr. Miller, uh, co-chair of steering and policy, my other colleagues on this distinguished panel. Uh, to that end, let me just say that we've been joined by the vice chair of our Democratic caucus, and that's Mr. Becerra of, uh, of California. Welcome, Javier. Um, to Judy Stein, Karen Davis, we thank you for sharing your insights and your expertise with us this morning. And we thank you to Ben Williamnowski and Cheryl Davis Darrell for sharing your very, very poignant stories. Like Social Security, Medicare is one of the bedrock foundations of our American social insurance system. For 47 years, it has provided health security, health care security for our seniors. When Lyndon Johnson signed Medicare into law in 1965, only half of Americans 65 and older had health care coverage. Now virtually all Americans 65 and older enjoy health care coverage. In the meantime, the average life expectancy of Americans has risen by a, a full eight years. In short, Medicare has transformed what it means to be old in this nation. It is a tremendous achievement that all Americans should be proud of and one of the most successful government programs in our history, which is why it is so troubling that the Ryan Romney budget would end Medicare as we know it. Instead of working to support seniors and families in these difficult times, their budget tries to dramatically cut spending on health care for seniors, turn the program into an underfunded voucher, and end the Medicare guarantee for every American under the age of 55. It shifts health care costs to seniors without doing anything about lowering the cost of health care. And moreover, as journalist David Rogers recently noted in the public in the publication Politico, Mr. Ryan's budget deliberately limits the rate of growth of Medicare spending by one half a percentage point from what he had previously allowed in his budget to prevent his budget from being in the red. This is not about the deficit. By incorporating these cuts to Medicare spending, the budget can then cut taxes for the wealthiest in our nation, the millionaires. 
This is quite literally robbing seniors and the middle class in order to give tax breaks to the wealthiest Americans. This is not the right way to move America forward. We should be working to strengthen Medicare, not endangering the health and the economic well-being of our parents and grandparents, as well as future generations, in order to pay for tax cuts for the wealthy. In today's hearing, we will hear from experts on the exact impact of the Romney-Ryan budget, what effect it will have on Medicare and America's seniors. We look forward to our conversation this morning. I thank you, and it's now my uh, a privilege uh, to introduce to you our colleague, George Miller, from California, co-chair of the Steering and Policy Committee. Mr. Miller. Thank you very much, Congresswoman DeLauro, and thank you, Leader Pelosi, for calling this hearing. The future of Medicare is an issue of utmost importance to every American, those who are retired and those who hope to retire. This program has been an unparalleled success. It has allowed millions of seniors to enjoy secure and dignified retirement. The millions of working people are counting on it being there for them when they retire. The good news is that thanks to the Affordable Care Act, Medicare has been made stronger. Seniors have greater access to preventative benefits and they're paying less for their prescription drugs. But despite these successes, challenges remain. More work needs to be done to strengthen Medicare's financial footing. We all recognize that. These are, however, there, there are, however, those who would use these challenges as a long-awaited opportunity to dismantle Medicare guarantee, turn it over to the private insurance companies, and add thousands of dollars in additional cost onto the backs of seniors. And that's exactly the kind of attack, the, the program that we have seen in this Congress with the Ryan budget. Study after study shows that under the Republican Medicare plan, Americans would have to pay thousands of dollars extra per year for their health care. And that's not just for future retirees current retirees would see significant cost increases. By repealing Obamacare and its Medicare improvements, the Republican plan would increase health care costs by thousands of dollars for, for today's seniors in form of higher prescription drug costs, additional costs for basic wellness screenings. But it's even worse for future retirees. Seniors who, who, who plan to start Medicare in 2023 or 2030 will now are on notice that they will have to set aside tens of thousands of dollars between now and those dates, and in some cases hundreds of thousands of dollars for the unanticipated costs that they will incur because of the changes in future Medicare uh, formulations for payments and for securing their health care security. There aren't many middle class families that in this short notice over the next 10 years can set aside this kind of money on top of the money that they're trying to set aside for their children's education, for their pension plans, and now they're told, get ready, you're going to have to have an extra $100,000 available to pay for your increased health care costs. And the cost only gets later the later they retire. They get, the costs get larger and more, more oppressive to, the, to their ability to support their families. I don't know many working people who can save the thousands of dollars to cover these future costs. Not in my district. They don't exist, and I've already started hearing from them. Right now, half of our seniors survive only on Social Security. Millions of future retirees lost their homes and retirement savings as a result of the financial scandals. Long stagnant wages have not helped household incomes. Working people are just starting to rebuild their financial lives. Any plan that would expect these households to start saving hundreds of thousands of dollars more starting right now is not a plan based upon reality. And if they can't save that kind of money, seniors will have to go into debt. They will be forced to sell their homes. They will, they will have to rely on their children just to pay for medi basic medical care. This is not what I would call a dignified retirement. Yet we must still work to strengthen the Medicare program. It needs to be sustainable for both seniors and taxpayers well into the future. Part of that was accomplished with the, with the passage of the Affordable Care Act. But over the last two years, strengthening Medicare has not been on the House agenda. House Republicans did nothing to extend the life of this program. They did nothing to ensure that the next generation of seniors can count on the Medicare guarantee. All they gave us was a plan to end the Medicare guarantee. Congress needs an honest examination of all these policies and how they would impact seniors today and tomorrow. That's why this hearing is so important. I'd like to thank the witnesses for joining us. Your expertise and your personal stories inform, inform the debate and make better policy outcomes. I look forward to your testimony. And with that, I'd like to uh, recognize uh, Congresswoman DeLauro. Uh, thank you very, very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to introduce our, our uh, for Introductions of our witnesses this morning, uh, Mr. Clyburn uh, from South Carolina, who is the assistant leader. Good. Thank you very much, Madam Co-Chair, Mr. Co-Chair, Madam Leader, uh, my <laughs> uh, colleagues. Thank you so much for uh, being here today, and I want to welcome uh, this 
uh, expert uh, panel here today. Welcome all of you. But most particularly, uh, I would like to welcome Ms. Sarah Davis Durrell, who hails uh, from my hometown of Sumter, uh, and her family are great constituents. Uh, she uh, left her hometown and went off to Palm Beach County, Florida, uh, where she retired, I think, after 31 years uh, as a public school teacher. I was in Palm Beach County, Florida for the last three days. Uh, Stuart even learned how to pronounce Hope Sound. Uh, it doesn't spell that way, but they told me that's the way I should pronounce it. Um, and I had a long meeting with the NWCP president there that you were very active with, Reverend Jerry Gore. Uh, and uh, I know that you have been um, uh, very active uh, with uh, the Social Security uh, and Medicare Committee uh, and other organizations uh, in your hometown, and I want to thank you so much for being here. Uh, I look forward to your testimony, look forward to all four of the testimonies here today, and I would like to yield back. Thank you, Mr. Leader. What I want to do is to have, uh, first I want to introduce uh, Congressman John Larson of Connecticut, who was chair of our Democratic Caucus, and welcome him uh, to, the, uh, to the forum. Uh, what I'm going to ask is all those who are making an introduction, we will do all four introductions at one time, and then we will uh, commence, and uh, 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 Ben will be the uh, kickoff witness, and I would like to recognize the uh, senior uh, Democrat on the Budget Committee, Mr. Van Hollen of Maryland. Chris? Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. DeLauro, and I want to again uh, join the, the leader and my colleagues uh, in welcoming all of uh, you today. Uh, I also have a, a constituent uh, in the group, uh, Dr. Ben Williamowski, and it's great to have uh, you with us. Uh, Dr. Williamowski served in the U.S. Army Dental Corps uh, on active duty from 1951 to 1953 during the Korean crisis. Upon his return from service, uh, he maintained a practice in family dentistry uh, in Montgomery County, Maryland, and retired in that, from that practice in 1998. Uh, upon his retirement, uh, he volunteered to undertake the directorship of the Alpha Omega U.S. Foundation, the philanthropic arm of the Alpha Omega International Dental Fraternity. Uh, the foundation's mission is, and I quote, reaching out to the needs of dental care, education, research, and care throughout the world. Uh, he continues in that position today. Uh, he was also the founder of the National Children's Home for Children with Special Needs and its first dental director, also a volunteer uh, position. Uh, Dr. Williamowski is married. He's the father of three children, eight grandchildren, and five great-grandchildren. His favorite philosopher is Ralph Waldo Emerson, and above his desk, Dr. Williamowski has a plaque that says, quote, all are needed by each one. Nothing is fair or good alone, end of quote. I think that captures the essence of the Medicare program. Uh, we all put into it, and we're all in it together, uh, and it's, off, it's necessary to preserve that security for all. So thank you all, Dr. William Mouski. I'm proud to have you as a constituent. Thank you. Uh, I would now like to introduce our next witness, a longtime advocate for seniors and a dear friend of Congressman Larson and myself uh, from Connecticut, Judy Stein. Judy is the founder and the executive director of the Center for Medicare Advocacy. As a co-director of legal assistance to Medicare patients, uh, which was in existence from 1977 to 1986, she managed the very first Medicare advocacy program in the country. And since 1975, she has worked to represent senior citizens through the center, and she has been lead or co-counsel in several cases challenging improper Medicare denials. Judy was also a delegate to the 2005 White House Conference on Agents, Aging and received the Connecticut Commission on Aging AgeWise Advocate Award in 2007. Judy, thank you so much for being with us here today, sharing your insights and your expertise, and we look forward to your testimony. Mr. Miller. Madam Chair, I'd like to, to introduce uh, Dr. Karen Davis, who is president of the Commonwealth Fund. The Commonwealth Fund is engaged in the independent research on health and social policy issues. Uh, they've been a remarkable resource to this Congress on both sides of the aisle as we try to grapple uh, with good decisions with respect to health and social policies. 
prior to joining the Commonwealth Fund, uh, she chaired the Health Policy Department at John Hopkins University. She also previously served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services. Karen, welcome to the committee. Thank you so much, and we look forward to your testimony. Thank you. We will now begin the testimony, and Dr. Wilmowski, we will start with you, and then with uh, Cheryl, with uh, Judith, and with Karen. Thank you. Press the... Thank you. Okay. Uh, I want to thank the uh, National Committee for the Preservation of Social Security and Medicare for giving me the Microphone. opportunity to share some of my feelings with you uh, about uh, the future of, uh, of Medicare. Uh, as uh, Mr. Van Hollen mentioned, I'm a retired dentist, and since then I am uh, director of a foundation. Uh, he told you what our mission was, and uh, I think it's important to just mention now that in that position, if I didn't see it before, I know now what it is to to uh, uh, help to care for uh, senior citizens with uh, uh, poor economic uh, status and many of them with uh, physical and cognitive disabilities. Uh, of course, you don't have to be a senior citizen to avail yourself of what we're trying to do, but I see perhaps far too many of those. Uh, I want to uh, uh, apologize for reading a lot of this, uh, uh, a lot of my remarks, but it's in the interest of brevity. When I asked Reva, what should I speak about, she said about five minutes. <laughs> so uh, when I became eligible to participate in the Medicare program, I was elated. From the history of my own parents, my wife's parents, and the parents of many of my friends, the elation was fueled by the expectation of being taken care of medically for the rest of my life. Now I have friends who are past my age, and like me and my wife, uh, we're both 87. Of course, after that walk up that hill, I think I'm 97. <laughs> and we spend many days visiting doctors and unfortunately, a lot of funerals. Sure, we want to live longer. No one wants to be 100 except the person who's 99. You've heard that. <laughs> but doctors' visits and visits to the pharmacy are getting more and more frequent and believe me, we are getting nervous. Perhaps the cost of prescription drugs, even with Part D benefits, can put quite a crimp in one's budget. Now when I hear that there's a possibility that benefits will dry up, falling to what is commonly called the donut hole, and that we will be paying for more for medications, I really get nervous. I do not have a, uh, uh, I read about proposed voucher systems that will take care of that, put that in quotes, that will allow the elderly to take care of their pharmaceutical needs. But what happens when the vouchers are gone, particularly if I hope to live as long as some of my friends who are older? Bob, who's here with me behind me, Abe, Norm, Evelyn, and many others, that really, really makes me nervous. And I hear that there's no need to worry. You'll be able to purchase health care insurance from insurance companies. No thanks. Been there, done that. Now I'm more nervous and concerned as ever. Now multiply all of my anxieties by the number of elderly who have less resources than do I, who live out their lives and have a chorus of folks who want to live and who ask that whoever is making out the rules Please help us to live a little longer and to live in decent health and be able to afford that health. You have medications, and, and this, I uh, uh, Mr. Van Hollen mentioned my family. I do indeed have a beautiful family with uh, uh, three children, eight grandchildren, five great grandchildren, and this is what I would like to tell them at this time. You have medications you need to stay healthy, and they will be low cost, so you don't have to skip Medicare or cut in half to make it go further. That's if the proposals that this committee have put forth will be carried out. It is expected the donut hole, the one you would fall into when there is no more funds available for your drugs, will be eliminated by 2020. And I hope for your sake, I'm not sure I will be around, but you certainly will be, and hopefully you will not be as nervous as I am now. You will have free preventative services and wellness visits such as flu shots, mammograms, and no-cost screening for cancer, diabetes, and other chronic diseases. Uh, and uh, I hope you, my children and grandchildren, will not have to skip such services, services that would otherwise be difficult to afford and, of course, to pay the price later. Believe me, such programs offer services that will make, have, uh, give many of us the opportunity to deliver out our lives more years than we ever would have envisioned, but years we could afford regardless of whatever bumps in the road go with advancing years. I thank my doctors who have insisted on such wellness visits and prescribed accordingly. One more thing I would like to say at the, at the very end, and that is that I have a special prayer that I say to my children on behalf of 
one of our grandchildren, their sister, cousin, niece, daughter, uh, Lauren, who will not be denied health care benefits under without the change in the uh, Medicare and the uh, uh, health benefit system because she underwent surgery uh, at the age of three for, and prolonged treatment for a malignant brain tumor. And because she's reached a certain age and possibly will be denied benefits because of that pre existing condition. And even if she did live that, that out, live to, I mean, she is living to that time, thank goodness. But uh, uh, I think that the, uh, I, don't, I will not accept the solution that don't worry about it. You'll be able to have some vouchers to take care of it, or you'll buy insurance from a private company. And you can imagine what the cost of that would be. Besides all of the above, I further hope and pray that the Affordable Health Care Act will help my children and grandchildren during the years that precede their becoming seniors. Finally, when you consider what could lie ahead for you in health care as you live to an age that you never thought possible, that you will never be as nervous as I am. Thank you. Thank you so much, Di Dr. Wojnowski. Uh, very poignant, very poignant indeed. Cheryl? Good morning, Leader Pelosi, co-chairs of the committee, representatives DeLauro, and Miller, and members of the committee. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak to you today. My name is Cheryl Davis Darrell, and I'm here with my husband, Christopher. I would like to tell you a little about myself and what Medicare and Medicaid mean to me. I am a 54-year-old retired preschool teacher living in West Palm Beach, Florida. Medicare is very special to me. Many individuals have a family member or know of a person who relies on Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. My story begins seven years ago when both of my parents became very ill at the same time. They needed extensive medical treatment and long-term care facilities to survive. I became their primary caregiver almost overnight while working a full-time job. I was totally overwhelmed. I did not know what to do or where to go for health care services. It turned out that Medicare and Medicaid provided a seamless flow of health care services when they were needed for both of my parents, and that was very important to me. This could not have happened with the Ryan voucher. I am not happy with the possibilities of losing my future Medicare. Why? Because to me, Medicare along with Medicaid is a success story. Medicare is doing what it was designed to do many years ago, provide guaranteed health benefits and your choice of providers. Everyone knows about vouchers, but do you really wonder, but you really wonder what they're really worth. A coupon comes to my mind when you go to the store, you actually do not save much using them. The Ryan voucher brings to light that without Medicare, just what a major illness could do to me. That's even if I survive the Ryan voucher's cap on Medicare health care spending. I did not foresee the Ryan voucher when I made my retirement budget plans for the future. If I thought health care and retirement was going to cost my husband and me thousands of dollars more per year, I would need much more savings. But I, like many other hardworking individuals who were unable to save while raising their family, you have peace of mind when you know that you are participating in Social Security and Medicare. I took pride in my weekly paycheck deductions and my coworkers felt the same way. I am not looking forward to a Ryan voucher at the age of 65 and having to wonder, what am I going to do when my limited voucher is not enough to pay for my health care services I need or when it is not enough to pay for the plan that includes my doctors? Adding insult to injury. 
is hearing the constant threat of appealing the Affordable Care Act, which will help people under the age of 65 obtain health care insurance before they become eligible for Medicare. This could easily have been me trying to find affordable private health insurance if it were not for my husband's health care coverage on his job. The Ryan plan would also replace all of the health care preventative screenings and assistant with prescription drug costs that the health reform legislation provides. It sends cold chills down my spine. We are talking about the quality of life for our future generation. I'm looking forward to working with you, the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare, and others to ensure that Medicare will be here for my husband and me, my daughter, my granddaughters, and future generations. The bottom line is that Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid is working. They are working to fulfill the needs of our aging population. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Stein? Those are hard acts to follow, but I'll try. Leader Pelosi, <coughs> a special shouts out to Representative Larson and Deloro, my, two of my mentors from Connecticut, members of the committee. Okay. Thank you for holding this important forum and for honoring me with the opportunity to appear. I will also read in, in the interest of brevity. I'm the founder and executive director of the Center for Medicare Advocacy. Founded in 1986, the center is a national nonprofit, nonpartisan organization headquartered in Connecticut, Washington, D.C., and with offices around the country. I've been representing beneficiaries in Medicare since 1976. My organization has represented tens of thousands of Medicare beneficiaries, more, I believe, than any other organization in the country some with the help also, I must say, of Representative Stark. Thank you for your long work on their behalf. I know the value of Medicare and its challenges as well as anyone. Medicare was enacted in 1965, as Representative DeLauro said, because private insurance failed older people. It has been so successful that this population is now almost uniformly insured although only 50% of people 65 or older were insured when Medicare began. I've seen Medicare coverage literally save lives and bring peace of mind to families. I also know how Medicare has changed, and while the coverage has been enhanced over the years, Medicare has also become more complex, difficult to navigate, <clears throat> incredibly, as private plan options have been introduced, swarmed in and out, and premiums have been income-based. While we are regularly told that one size fits all, does not serve people well, this was simply not the case for the traditional Medicare program. In fact, for decades, the guaranteed universal Medicare program fit most very well. Today, the myriad Medicare choices, complex decision-making, and planned variations baffle many, often leading to inertia and poor planning. Generally, people who have received their health insurance through employment and are becoming eligible for Medicare are not accustomed to choosing insurance. Many people simply don't, and those who do often never make a switch and stay with the plan even though the offerings change and their health needs change. Further, people want choice of doctors and hospitals and health care providers, not insurance plans. And traditional Medicare offers far more choice of health providers than private insurance for older and disabled people. Unfortunately, Congressman Ryan proposes, proposes, and the House has twice passed, yet another effort to privatize and fragment Medicare, this time on a grand scale. The voucher, as 
my colleagues to the right stated, or annual allowance is like going to be like giving um, someone $5 to go purchase a pair of shoes. Some will be able to get the shoes that fit. Most will not and will need extra money to pay for the ones that will work, that will allow them to walk without blisters. Unfortunately, that will also mean that we will have a two-tiered, at least, healthcare system. Regardless of its details, and we haven't seen many, the Ryan Plan is not about the deficit, as it will start at the earliest in 2022. It assumes that Medicare costs would be reduced by requiring beneficiaries to spend their limited vouchers to purchase health insurance, and by allowing, requiring Medicare and private plans to complete in the private market. The certitude that com competition in the private market will reduce Medicare costs is belied by past experience and numerous studies. As former Medicare and Medicaid Administrator Bruce, Bruce Vladek has said, private plans have not saved Medicare a nickel. In fact, under his leadership, we introduced Medicare Plus Choice, which paid the private plans 95 cents on the dollar. They came in in droves and left in droves, particularly in Connecticut, where my area of the state was left with no plans at all, because they could, in fact, not keep pace with the cost-effective Medicare program. In 2003, Congress authorized Medicare Advantage, which paid 14% more than it cost to serve the same person in traditional Medicare, an estimated $150 billion over 10 years, according to the Congressional Budget Office. <clears throat> so it is certainly possible that Medicare, it's necessary that Medicare be made for not financially more viable. But doing so by offering more private plans will not reduce the costs of Medicare, will not reduce the deficit, and will not serve the seniors and the people with disabilities better in this country. Thus, the t traditional Medicare program, in fact, which the Ryan Plan would dismantle, shows greater promise for controlling costs and serving our people than any private plan options. This has been stated most recently in the New England Journal of Medicine, which reported on an urban study, urban institute study, which concluded that the data do not support the need for major restructuring of either Medicare or Medicaid. In summary, the Center for Medicare Advocacy welcomes the opportunity to examine Medicare's challenges and successes. But for the 49 million American families who rely on Medicare now, and for all those who will someday, we look for a debate based in fact, not preferences, and one that will continue to serve our country, our taxpayers, and truly watch the deficit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Karen? Thank you, Madam Chairman, Madam Leader, members of the committee. Medicare works uh, to provide access to care and financial protection for almost 50 million seniors and disabled beneficiaries who have contributed to the program throughout their working lives and who continue to contribute through uh, supplemental premiums and out-of-pocket expenses. Careful consideration needs to be given to the consequences of alternative strategies for modifying Medicare. Converting Medicare to a fixed sum of money capped at the growth of the economy without effective health care cost control would shift costs to beneficiaries who already struggle with out-of-pocket medical expenses and limited income. An alternative approach of continuing guaranteed benefits and rewarding hospitals and physicians for providing high quality care in an efficient manner has the potential to achieve needed budgetary savings while reducing, not increasing, financial risk to beneficiary. The philosophy supporting premium support proposals holds that patients are best positions to eliminate overuse of services, shop for lower cost care, pick lower cost health plans. Rather than guaranteeing that Medicare will pay the cost of a defined set of benefits under the most recent Medicare premium proposal put forward by Representative Paul Ryan, Chairman of the House Committee, 
Beneficiaries would be given an allowance based on their age, health status, and it would be, uh, as a backup, limited to the rate of growth in the gross domestic pro uh, product uh, per capita, plus 0.5%. Uh, this approach would result in the federal government spending less over time as beneficiaries spent more, assuming health care costs continue to rise at current rates. The value of the allowance for defined contribution for private insurance would erode over time, resulting in higher premiums for beneficiaries or reductions in benefits. The Congressional Budget Office estimated that the most recent Ryan proposal would raise costs for beneficiaries over time. Our own estimate is that average private health insurance premiums would exceed the allowance by $4,250 in 2030 and increase substantially after that. Private health insurance is more costly than Medicare. CBO estimates that private coverage for a set of benefits like Medicare covers is 12% more expensive than traditional Medicare and would grow more rapidly, in fact, be 40% more expensive than traditional Medicare by 2030. Our own studies find that beneficiaries are less satisfied uh, with Medicare Advantage plans, experience more access problems. I'm further concerned that opening up Medicare to a choice of competing private plans would further undermine the stability and effectiveness of Medicare by fragmenting the risk pool. Uh, uh, providers are likely to opt out of traditional Medicare to get higher payments under private plan, nullifying it as a genuine choice for beneficiary. The program currently uh, uses its leverage to drive efficiency among providers and widespread change. Also concerned about the potential for cream skimming with sicker patients uh, uh, staying in traditional Medicare and healthier patients being uh, lured into private plans. Um, the uh, Romney-Ryan plan also would raise the age of eligibility for Medicare to age 67 by 2033 and repeal the Affordable Care Act, which, as we've heard today, reduces the deficit, extends the solvency of the trust fund to 2024, as well as improving prescription drugs and preventing services uh, for Medicare benefit rate of growth. Uh, th uh, this will also lower costs for beneficiaries as spending, uh, as cost sharing and supplemental premiums go down. Uh, in short, as policymakers and the nation confront the urgent health spending while continuing to improve the quality and efficiency of care delivered, these activities provide a foundation on which to build with the potential to control health spending while moving toward a high performance health system. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much. And uh, what we want to do now is to move to questions. Let me first say we've been joined by several other colleagues, and that's Congressman uh, Ellison from Minnesota, uh, Congresswoman Schwartz, I don't know if you're introduced earlier from Pennsylvania, but and Congressman Farr from California. Um, a couple of ground, oh, I'm sorry, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee uh, from Texas. Um, and uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to say to my colleagues first, we, are, we have a lot of members, and this is great, and uh, we have expert witnesses, so what we want to try to do is there will be a total of three minutes uh, for question and answer, and I'm going to ask that questions be direct and brief so that we can hear from our experts. Agreed? All right, we're all there. Now I want to start that questioning with uh, Congressman Stark of California. Uh, thank you, Congressman Delora and George, Leader Pelosi, uh, for organizing today's hearings. Um, the future of Medicare is important to the country, not just for those of us seniors today, but for future generations. And uh, we lead the way in Medicare in driving delivery system reforms ways that reduce waste and improve quality and save money for us all. But the urgent question, I think, when we talk about what Ryan and his gang are trying to do, uh, basically what they are doing, it, in my opinion, is limiting people's choice of doctors and shifting the costs in the future to middle and lower income Americans 
in order to pay for a tax break for those of us who enjoy good salaries. Um, how would you explain, Ms. Davis, Ms. Stein, uh, in that order, uh, how does the Romney-Ryan plan limit the people's choice of physicians? Um, the uh, Ryan premium support would base the premium, this is the most recent version, on the second cheapest plan. It would require it to have the same actuarial value as Medicare benefits, but they could opt to include fitness services, say, and not cover home health. But how would they get the premium down to that level? That's by limiting the doctors that are in their network. So if you need an oncologist, you wouldn't be guaranteed that that uh, provider was in the plan. So I think you're exactly right that by basing the voucher on the second cheapest plan available, it uh, would lead to inadequate networks uh, and limited choice for beneficiaries. Ms. Stein? Uh, not only do I echo what uh, Ms. Davis said, but also we need to look at what we actually know because this is not something new. The current private plans and the private plans in the past have all had this impact, and that is that the widest network is traditional Medicare. As soon as you enter into a private plan, and this will be the case with Mr. Ryan's plan, you will have a limited network with limited op uh, options for choice of doctors. And in fact, that's the choice that people want, and that will be limited under the Ryan plan. Can you add on a little bit as to how costs will uh, keep going up, not just for individuals, uh, but for the entire health care system in this country and as well. I think that's one of the real shames of um, what uh, Mr. Ryan is proposing. We have traditional Medicare, with, which if we encourage to be the, the option for, for most of those with Medicare, currently almost 50 million people, has the best bargaining power of uh, <clears throat> any other health system in the country. It's the only semi health system in the country. And so it can bring down costs if allowed to. So for instance, I think we should be requiring negotiation with prescription drugs under Part D. Uh, when you fragment Medicare, as we have been doing since the 1990s, you reduce the, uh, the risk, not only the risk pool, but the buying power of Medicare, which thereby <coughs> reduces its impact on health care costs for everyone uh, uh, throughout the country, not just for Medicare beneficiaries. Thank, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank the witnesses who brought us their personal stories, and thank both Ms. Davis and Ms. Stein for thank your you expertise. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm recognizing members as they came into the, uh, into the room. So next is Congressman. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Nadler of New York has arrived as well. Just go for it, Mr. Scott of Virginia. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I want to thank um, you and Mr. Miller and particularly uh, Ms. Pelosi for holding this forum. We've been trying to get some an intelligent discussion on, on Medicare, and you can't do that in a shouting matches on cable TV and 30-second um, uh, commercials. So this gives us an opportunity to ask questions like, um, is it true that people on Medicare today are not protected from these proposals? The um, premium support allowance would apply to people now under age 55, so it's been alleged it wouldn't hurt anyone currently on Medicare, but it well could. First of all, the repeal of the Affordable Care Act means that current beneficiaries lose their protection in the donut hole. They lose uh, their preventive services available without cost sharing. So there are implications. But by encouraging private plans, it also can lure doctors and hospitals out of traditional Medicare. Uh, so when, uh, because they typically pay doctors and hospitals more than Medicare. So that might affect uh, the ability of people who are currently on Medicare to continue to see the same physician. As the Medicare population gets older, what happens to Part B premiums? 
Uh, the Part B premiums are based on 25% of the total cost of uh, physician services over time, so obviously aging affects that. But as Medicare has so for, to raise so, 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 prices. So for, so for present beneficiaries, you, your Part B premium will go up under this plan a lot higher than it would if, this, if the premium support Ryan Romney plan were adopted. Say, say again? The, the, your medic, your, under their plan, under their plan, the Part B premiums would begin to skyrocket. Uh, can you um, explain? You mentioned um, uh, doctors and private plans having different panels. Uh, can you explain why choosing a choice on Medicare as an option uh, cannot work? The, the main problem is that as you fragment the risk pool, uh, you lead to incentives for private plans to lure doctors out of traditional Medicare, lure healthy beneficiaries out of Medicare. It makes traditional Medicare more expensive. It's what's called a death spiral. It would make uh, that option less attractive, both because it didn't have enough doctors to serve patients and it had sicker people. And can they... Um have doctors on a private plan have doctors that don't uh, aren't the best cancer diabetes and AIDS specialists if you don't have them on your panel will that make their plans less desirable for those that are actually sick if I may one of the things that we one of the things I want to call to your attention is that um, we can look at this from current and past history we know what happens we know that only 10 percent of people in Part D according to a study by the National Bureau of Economic Research, make a, ch make a change of plans when they, once they make a choice. It's, it's mind-boggling set of options. It's not uh, one or two choices in a cafeteria. It's dozens. And you should make a change every year, or at least look, but only 10% do. So what happens is not knowing, even if you were basing your choice on what you ex expect to happen next year, you don't really know. And number two, most people don't make a choice. So therefore, we find in, in the trenches that people call us at the Center for Medicare Advocacy when the choice they made is no longer effective because they, didn't, they made the choice and many people in private plans now are the weller, the less ill, the less frail beneficiaries, disabled and uh, older. And so they find that now they've they've been diagnosed with a disease they did not have when they chose the plan, they'd like to go for a second opinion or they'd like to see the best doctor for that particular disease and that person is not in their plan. If they were in traditional Medicare, they could do that. And we have myriad clients with this particular problem. Um, and then they also, if I may say, have very significant problems appealing the denials and limitations on getting bills paid that mount up. So we know from current experience that private plan options in Medicare are not the best for, for any number of reasons, including cost and service for people, and don't, do not provide as many options in health care providers as traditional Medicare does. Thank you. Uh, Congresswoman Donna Edwards from Maryland. Thank you very much, um, I, and th thanks to our witnesses. I'm trying to understand what this means in practical terms for your average senior. And so as I listened to Cheryl's testimony um, and noted that she's 54 years old, I'm 54 years old, and had contributed, obviously, as we all do in our paychecks, and I was enthusiastic to look at that every week, uh, too. And so now, having worked all this time, since I was about 14 years old regularly every year, I now know that I'm going to have to put in some more in addition to what I've already saved. And so is it really true that at 54 that I could expect that I will have to save between now and then in addition to saving for my retirement, that I will have to save about $60,000 in order to meet the costs? <laughs> Can you say That's, it louder that's the basic in the microphone? <laughs> <laughs> Bottom line, um, 
Uh, the Congressional Budget Office estimated that the proposal first advanced in 2011, uh, Medicare now pays 70 percent of beneficiary expenses. It would only pay 32 percent of beneficiary expenses, so you can just see how much you have to make. Uh, so in 11 years, I will have to save $60,000 in addition to my private savings that I had for uh, to match my Social Security for retirement, a third of which I lost under the economic policies of the last administration. So you're telling me that over the next 11 years that I have to make up what I lost on my private retirement plus $60,000 a year? How is it possible for average Americans to do that? Well, I think I you're exactly right, that the value of savings uh, have eroded, been wiped out, uh, particularly people who've lost jobs, uh, haven't been able to get another job, they go into retirement without a secure base. If they have to live on their Social Security checks, half of those checks would have to go for health care expenses and premiums. And so just so that I really do understand that, I just have one child, and he's now 24, and by my calculations, he would also have to save about $360,000 in addition, because he's only a one child, to taking care of me in my retirement. How does this plan not just gut not only my retirement, but the retirement of future generations too? Representative Edwards, I think you're speaking to exactly why Medicare was enacted in 1965. And what's being proposed is sunsetting. I've heard that phrase. We need to sunset Medicare. I've even heard it referred by a candidate in my state to sunset both Medicare and, Me and Social Security. And this is why you have exactly expressed why we enacted Medicare in 1965. Because it, the private market doesn't serve, and you really can't provide the savings necessary. Thanks. I just wanted to try to understand this in really plain language. I appreciate you. Thank you. Uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, California. Thank you very much. Let me first thank um, Leader Pelosi and the Steering Policy Committee, Ms. DeLauro and Mr. Miller, and all of the members who are here today to really uh, allow uh, our panelists, our experts, to come forward and really tell the truth about what is taking place as it relates to Medicare. We've heard so many um, misrepresentations, and I think that this panel here today in this forum really um, clears the air and w it allows the American people to really know what the deal is. I wanted to ask uh, Cheryl uh, a little bit more about this, the voucher, the process, how do you, how, or any of you, how do you how do you see or how do you understand a voucher, you know, as, as being the vehicle for health care, for Medicare? You take like a, a food stamp or a check or to a physician and for whatever amount of money it is and hope that they'll be able to take care of you for whatever the voucher says it is, or how, do, how is this going to happen as you see it? Well, my concerns are um, a voucher or a coupon is as good as the organization that's giving it to you, the face value. They determine the value of the voucher or the coupon, and that's not set. That can change at a whim of whoever's, you know, sponsoring it. That's what my concern is. And the rest of the question, I will refer to my, the expert here. So here's my visual aid, which um, Representative DeLauro and, and, and Larson, <coughs> Mr. Larson have seen. This, this is a Medicare brochure from my organization. And in a relatively brief period, uh, piece, we can give you a set uh, tell you what Medicare will, you know, basically but accurately can tell you what Medicare will offer in the traditional Medicare program now. And, and this is what we know about the, the Ryan plan. <laughs> it's, um, it's a voucher which will be worth a certain amount of money 
and, and it's not that you will take it, as I understand it, to your physician so much, is that you will, you will use this amount of money to purchase a private health insurance plan, which is what people were doing before 1965, or trying to doing, do and run into the problems that Representative Edwards suggested. That is affecting not just them, but their children and their children's children. So we don't have an accurate picture, but what I, as I um, uh, analogized before, it's like everyone will get a base amount. I am, so say it's $5, please get, take your $5 allowance and go buy a pair of shoes, Johnny. And you go if you only have $5 because you can't put more towards it. So Susie has five dollars in allowance but she's a richer kid and so she's got ten dollars to add to her five dollars so she can go and buy a fifteen dollar pair of shoes johnny only has the five dollar voucher he's got to go to pay less or walmart and buy the five dollar pair of shoes that's what health care will be you will get a set amount as i understand it to purchase health care in the private market or stick with Medicare, so traditional Medicare. Just in following up, uh, Madam Chair, if, if there are no plans that cost any more than, more than $5, if all of them cost more than $5, then what happens with this voucher? And what happens to the person who needs health care? Well, you'll have to pick the one that uh, is, may not meet your, is, may not be as broad a coverage as you like, but that you can afford. And I bet that there will be some subsidies to help people do that, but that's, that's essentially what the problem will be. If you can't make up the difference between what the premium is and the value of this voucher, you'll be uninsured. I mean, that's the bleak reality that instead of everyone over 65 being covered, for the first time we will start having elderly uninsured. Uninsured. So first time, and now we have almost 98% insured, and I think the Commonwealth Fund just came up with a percentage of about or number of about how many more uninsured we would expect. Thank you. Thank you. Congressman Holt from New Jersey. Thank you, Representative DeLauro, and, and to our leader and co-chairs for making this possible, because right now the airwaves and the, uh, uh, and, and the coffee shops around the country are full of slogans and misrepresentation about what, a Medi what Medicare is, what it does, and what needs to be done with it. And, and indeed, there's talk about sunsetting Medicare because it's fundamentally flawed and can't keep up with the uh, rising cost of health care. Um, it, 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 it seems to me that the problem is not just Medicare's. We have a problem with rising health care, uh, rising cost of health care in America. Uh, it's not Medicare's fault. And in fact, I would like you to address whether Medicare is dealing better with the rising cost of health care than private insurance. Uh, you know, it's clear to me that, that the Romney-Ryan plan is intended for people to pay more out of pocket. They want them to pay, pay more out of pocket so that they can become shoppers more than patients uh, and use market forces to reduce health care costs. Um, I, I think uh, uh, Ms. Davis, you said there are other more effective ways already in the Affordable Care Act to reduce the rising cost of health care, of you know, stopping giveaways to insurance companies, uh, uh, in, incorporating inefficiencies, trying to avoid, uh, uh, coordinate. The question, Congressman so Holt. Waste. So there are really two questions there. Right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. A recent study in the New England Journal of Medicine found that Medicare over the next decade on a per beneficiary basis is projected to go up 3.1%. Private insurance is going up 5%. So you might think a 2% difference isn't much, but you add it up over 10, 20, 30 years, you create a huge gap between what what you cost under Medicare, and you're already starting with private insurance costing 12% than Medicare. 
And the second question, why is Medicare better able to control costs? It is because it uses its leverage as a purchaser on behalf of 49 million Medicare beneficiaries. It gets good prices. You don't have to read the fine print. Nearly every doctor, every hospital in America participates in Medicare. Uh, you've got guaranteed benefits. You've got guaranteed access to care. Further, under the Affordable Care Act, uh, it has dedicated $10 billion over 10 years to testing innovative ways of rewarding primary care, uh, stopping uh, avoidable hospital readmissions, improving the efficiency of care and the outcomes of patients, and letting accountable care organizations share in those savings. And you have given the Secretary the authority to spread anything that works to improve quality or reduce cost without uh, the detriment of the other to apply that across the Medicare program. So we're on a path of innovation, uh, uh, trying to encourage primary care, care coordination, keeping people out of hospitals, uh, improving transitions between nursing homes and hospitals so that, that patients don't have to bounce back and forth. Thank you, and I thank the chairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Holtz. Uh, Congresswoman uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton from the district. In, uh, thank our chairs and, uh, and, and our leader for providing what could be an important opportunity. There's going to be, uh, uh, we're on the eve of a, um, of a presidential debate. I'm not sure that there will be the clarifying moment there that you have already provided uh, for us here. Um, importantly, the uh, uh, Medicare itself is linked uh, to two other important uh, uh, health care uh, provisions, uh, the Affordable Health Care Act and one we haven't discussed as much, uh, Medicaid. Uh, we know that uh, two-thirds of those on Medicaid turn out to be uh, the elderly and, and the disabled. Uh, we also know that the Ryan budget, uh, which has <laughs> placed um, Ryan, sorry, placed uh, seniors in the eye of the storm in, 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 in this presidential campaign, that the Ryan plan is, is purports to uh, cut uh, Medicaid over the next 10 years by about a third. So I think it would be helpful for you to, um, uh, to explain the link between Medicaid and Medicare, um, uh, and uh, particularly considering that Medicaid uh, serve seniors who are dual eligibles, uh, eligibles and, of course, seniors in other ways, but also has another entire pool of Americans to serve. Uh, you're absolutely right that the proposal to block grant Medicaid and have it grow over time with population plus 1% means that states would be under enormous fiscal pressure. Uh, having lost those federal dollars, uh, as you say, about a third cut in federal spending, to also reduce their uh, state spending rather than pick that up. As you mentioned, two-thirds of Medicaid outlays go for the elderly and disabled, most of that for long-term care. Uh, many middle-class working Americans exhaust their savings when they go into a nursing home, can't afford those annual bills go spin down onto Medicaid. So those benefits uh, would be at risk as well as the cuts in the Medicare program. So I think you're right to think about Medicare and Medicaid together and the overall implications. The study that the Commonwealth Fund reduced today also uh, estimated that block granting Medicaid would add an additional 12 million people to the uninsured roles as states cut back on eligibility uh, for Medicaid, in addition to those who would lose coverage from repeal of the Affordable Care Act. So as indicated earlier, there would be 72 million uninsured people in this country by 2022, 45 million more than would be the case with the Affordable Care Act and without block granting Medicaid. 
uh, is it is it is it true that if you were to compartmentalize where the money in Medicaid goes, that that uh, seniors in nursing homes or those in nursing homes, seniors and disabled in, in, in nursing homes, uh, take more of the funds than, for example, children, poor people. Uh, that, of course, means that states are left with a terrible Hobson's choice. I <laughs> wouldn't want to leave that to anybody. But, and thank you very much for, for your testimony. It was very helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, Congressman H Hank Johnson from Georgia. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, the um, Romney-Ryan plan to end Medicare as we know it cuts the social safety net for seniors, I believe, is, is what has been brought out so far this morning. Uh, there, those seniors are among those 47% uh, who are dependent on government, by the way, uh, according to their economic philosophy. Uh, now, Romney Ryan want to replace the we are all in this together or the all for one and one for all or the I am my brother's keeper philosophy uh, with a new economic philosophy of limited government and a every man for himself uh, free market economic philosophy. How does the Romney Ryan every man for himself free market economic philosophy square with the Ralph Waldo Emerson quote uh, <laughs> that you hold so dear, Dr. William Noski, uh, which uh, I've been trying to find it, but I have not been able to uh, find it. But it pretty much says all are needed by each one. Nothing is fair or good alone. How does said that, that economic in philosophy in 1847. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, what, what Emerson was talking about, though, was the, the value of uh, each person being uh, a part of the whole and the whole being uh, a reflection or a, uh, a manifestation of that individual part. Uh, Doug, uh, Dr. Stein uh, and uh, Dr. William Nowski, uh, if we could hear from you all on that. Uh, sure. I'm, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, uh, apologize in my uh, lack of the depth of knowledge that I've heard here. And boy, that's been very impressive. And I, uh, I'm, uh, for the many reasons, that's one that I'm glad I'm here. Uh, I think that there are a lot of things that are that have, uh, with all the things that have been mentioned in the proposed uh, health care, Affordable Health Care Act being changed or not accepted as it's been presented, I think one thing that's, that's really badly overlooked, and uh, I happen to know that personally as being a provider of uh, health care uh, in dentistry for so many years. Uh, not to be trite, but uh, we know that uh, uh, Prevention is often the best cure. And one of the things that uh, I don't think we've made enough of a, uh, uh, a uh, uh, noise about, if that's the right word, is the, in the Affordable Health Care Act, the wellness visits and the visits for screening and regular visits and regular visits to doctors. There's so many people now, uh, seniors or, or children or anybody who, who who don't who don't go to these uh, don't receive these benefits uh, regularly because they do not have the wherewithal to pay for it to pay for it. Uh, but maybe that was a a Freudian slip. Uh, to pray for it may be may be the proper thing. Uh, but I think that that would would save and correct me if I'm wrong. Seems to me that uh, people getting uh, uh, the wellness uh, wellness care and screenings and free visits, uh, not free visits, but visits paid for by the Act, would save Medicare tons and tons of money. I think the actuarians, act, actuaries yeah. could probably tell you exactly how much that would save. And uh, again, to maybe that's a roundabout way of getting to your uh, question uh, or your comments, in the foundation that I'm involved with, uh, a lot of that is helping to care for 
people who are far more in need than, than we are. Uh, it's everybody has to chip in and, and do their part and to give up something. I forget who it was who said it during the last uh, uh, election that uh, someone said that everybody is going to have to come up with something. The uh, insurance companies may have to give up something. The government may have to give up something. The uh, uh, consumer may have to give up something. The uh, providers may have to give up something. And we all have to give up a little bit, maybe to get to where we will not have so many people dependent on cost and increased cost for uh, treatment that they need through any kind of an act. Congressman well, I'll John. Put your question somewhere. Congressman Johnson, I'm going to intervene and uh, we can come back to Ms. Dine at another point, but we've got several other members uh, who need to ask questions and we are looking at a time clock as well. Congresswoman Schwartz, Pennsylvania. Well, thank you very much and thank you for holding this hearing because as he has been said, there's a lot of discussion about Medicare going on right now in our nation and a real threat to Medicare as we know it. I uh, appreciate my colleagues' uh, questions about how it affects both future seniors and current seniors, because it does have an effect on both. Um, before I do that, I will take a moment of, of personal privilege and to say to uh, the good dentist on the panel uh, that uh, my father served as a dentist in the Korean War and during those same years. So maybe we can have a little discussion where we met each other uh, in, in service to our nation. So uh, thank you for, for that. And I know maybe your children felt the same way, but it didn't seem really cool until the MASH uh, program came out on TV. And uh, um, although the dentist was kind of quirky on that one. So, um, but uh, thank you for your service to our country. And uh, we have a lot to do actually to make sure that Americans have access to dental coverage. I thank you for your comments on that. We often uh, don't speak about that. It's true for our seniors, it's true for our children. So uh, thank you for the work you're doing on that. Uh, I think that many of my colleagues actually made uh, the point about uh, how the, the uh, Ryan plan, now, uh, now embraced by uh, Mitt Romney, uh, to end Medicare as we know it for, uh, for future seniors, uh, the fact that it would be an inadequate voucher, we know that already, uh, and that it would mean that if you were wealthy and you could pay more, you could get, as you pointed out, better shoes, uh, but this would really mean you get the health benefits you need. If you don't, which is true for most Americans, you would not get the health benefits that you now have access to um, under Medicare. Uh, I also appreciate the fact that uh, I think uh, Dr. Davis, you pointed out very keenly, uh, we've worked closely on this, the importance of, re of reducing the rate of growth in costs under health care and Medicare's ability to do that, to reduce costs by eliminating, uh, well, by increasing patient safety in our hospitals, transitions of care, improving efficiency and effectiveness uh, is really important, not only to our seniors, but of course, our current seniors, but to all Americans. Uh, I did want to just take a, a, a ask you again to be uh, clear about what this means for our current seniors. The case has been made, don't worry about it. If you're over 65, you're only 54 and under, you might not get Medicare or you're not going to get Medicare as we know it. But if you're over 65, don't worry about it. There are no changes. Uh, that's not true. Uh, and uh, I did, yeah, I asked a question. So could you, could you speak again more uh, really clearly, Dr. Davis, you would do that, about how current seniors, because of the intention of to repeal the ACA in particular, would in fact hurt current seniors in this country? Well, obviously repeal of the Affordable Care Act as, as proposed in that budget proposal uh, would increase costs for preventing services and prescription drugs. But I'd like to talk about the way seniors get care. What's important to me in the Affordable Care Act is the creation of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation that is funding uh, innovations in uh, primary care medical homes, which I know you have ch championed. Um, so there is a comprehensive primary care initiative underway in seven states, 75 different physician practices. Medicare pays those primary care physicians an extra allowance to hire nurses to work with patients with complex conditions. All of that would go away with the repeal of the Affordable Care Act. So it's, it's not just insurance and it's not just cost sharing, it's not just benefits, it's the way people get care uh, would be affected by repeal, repeal of and the Affordable Care Act. And we're seeing the effect of that already with improved care and reduced costs. Right. Okay. And I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Becerra, California. Thank you all for your testimony. It's great to have you here. 
I'd like to begin with Ms. Davis, uh, although I can't really see it through these cameras. Uh, you mentioned that converting Medicare to a fixed sum of money that would be capped at the growth of the economy without effective health care cost controls uh, would do nothing more than shift the cost of care to seniors. And uh, I think Ms. Davis, Daryl mentioned something very interesting. She compared this Romney Ryan uh, voucher system to a coupon. I too have called it uh, coupon care because essentially it turns what is a guaranteed Medicare program into a coupon care program, which as uh, one of my colleagues before had mentioned, really turns you into a shopper, but a shopper without enough money to purchase everything you need. Uh, Ms. Davis, I was hoping you could give us a quick sense of how much less would this coupon give you into the future if we were to go down the Romney-Ryan path of voucherizing Medicare instead of having a guarantee where you would rely on the value of the coupon to give you health care which, without control, continues to skyrocket far faster than the value of the coupon. Uh, I can hear you even if I can't see you, so thank you very much for that, that question. Uh, yes, you're right. There would be a growing difference between what uh, even private insurance would cost and the value of the coupon over time. Our, uh, we know that private insurance is going up about two percentage points a year faster uh, than uh, the GDP on which this would be based. Um, we estimate that by 2030, the difference between the average health insurance premium and the value of the allowance would be $4,250. Actually, if you project it on out, and I was afraid to even mention the number to 2050, you're talking about a $15,000 difference. So uh, every year, uh, that voucher, by holding it down, that allowance, by holding it down, becomes less and less adequate. And it affects uh, all Medicare beneficiaries, even those that are now on the Medicare Advantage private plans. Uh, they would have to pay extra to continue that, that coverage, as and, well and as Ms. those on traditional And if Medicare. I could go to Ms. Stein. Ms. Stein, you mentioned that the voucher uh, will not, going toward voucher system, will not reduce the the cost to Medicare because as you and as Ms. Davis just pointed out, Medicare has cost us less over the last decade or two than has private health insurance. And so converting uh, Medicare, which is a guaranteed program, into a voucher or coupon care program where you rely on the private health insurance, which has higher costs, administrative costs that are about 17 percent compared to Medicare's 2 percent, you're essentially asking seniors to cover more of the cost out of pocket without the guarantee of the benefits. That's correct. And as I say, the history that we've already been through with Medicare Plus Choice and Medicare Advantage shows that Medicare private plans are more expensive than the traditional plan. By 14 percent before ACA, with, with the Affordable Care Act reducing payments to the private plans, it's down to about 7 percent. But it's extremely, it's much more expensive and it provides less choice of health care, and it fragments the system, which means that you don't have the same purchasing power. So for all those reasons, both moral and financial, it really does not make sense. It's simply based, I believe, on a belief and preference for private is better. But the facts belie the truth with regard to keeping health care costs for all down, which, by the way, as I understand it, is one of the keys to getting the deficit down. So um, really what we should be doing is encouraging a return to an increased number in the traditional Medicare program, not further fragmenting the Medicare program. And Madam Chair, I'll conclude by just mentioning to Mr. Williamnowski that I'm slightly more than half your age, but I hope to look half as good as you do when I'm 87 as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, Congressman Larson from Connecticut. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I thank our leader, and I am particularly grateful to uh, be joined by Judith Stein, who is just a remarkable advocate and has been so, and her organization has just done an outstanding job since 1986 uh, serving this nation. And uh, for members here, I will say, in conducting forums and teletown conferences, having an authority there to answer the questions as, it's as it relates to Medicare is important. 
kudos to all of our, those who have testified today. I think what our colleagues don't understand on the other side of the aisle is that this is personal. This is very personal for us. And this is, and I, and I think this needs to be framed here too. Uh, and I'm going to ask you two questions. One, you think this is an entitlement problem or do you think this is a health care problem and health care related problem? Number one. Number two, I said it's personal. And I mean that sincerely in as much as I go to visit my mother in a nursing home who's had two congestive heart failures, multiple sclerosis for more than 40 years, and now because of dementia requires 24-hour care. And walking up and down those halls, I see friends and neighbors in the same home experiencing this. Now we've talked about, we haven't really dwelled on dual payments. Uh, and you know of people that are both on Medicaid and Medicare recipients over age 55. Could you explain the devastating cuts that are made to Medicaid and their impact on those Medicare recipients? First, I'll respond to your first question. And um, one hates to keep having a love fest. But in a small state like Connecticut, we don't get a lot of glory. So I'll say thank you again to Congressman Larson and Representative DeLauro. Um, is it entitlement or health care? Well, first, let me say, I've asked my staff never to refer to Medicare as an entitlement ever again. I think there are lots of things that people think they're entitled to, but Medicare is not one of them. We do pay for Medicare, and more importantly, I think this is actually a health care matter, but first and foremost, it's a family and a community matter. And I think we, since I'm asked and I get a chance to be on a sort of a small soapbox here, what we need to do is remind people about the national family, the community. And, and, and also, insurance is based on as many in taking care of each other as possible. So it's the risk pool. You make it larger. You take care of each other, both for personal, family, and community reasons, for, and also because that's the insurance model. We enlarge the risk pool. We keep care of each other. And yes, it's a personal health care matter. We all have had problems with private insurance, and we all have had health care and injury issues. And I must tell you that I fight all the time on behalf of people who call me and my family to deal with private insurance concerns. It's a family health care matter. Uh, and I think that first and foremost, that's what we need to keep attention to and to stop fragmenting this program to the detriment of all concerned. And I'll let um, my colleague, Ms. Davis, answer your second question. Just to add quickly to that, I do think the issue that we need to attack is health care costs generally. Medicare is growing very slowly, uh, much slowly, uh, slower than overall health care costs. I would uh, reinforce that people have paid for this throughout their working lives. But the one point I wanted to stress is that the premium support proposal does not guarantee Medicare benefits. It doesn't guarantee that home health will be in there. It doesn't guarantee that skilled nursing facility services will be covered. Those services are not typically covered in private insurance. The only thing that's guaranteed is it would have the same actuarial value as the Medicare benefit package, but you could fill that in with memberships in, in, fit, uh, in gyms, fitness uh, centers. Uh, so you're not guaranteed that home health would be covered. You're not guaranteed that SNF services would be covered. So I think that's important to know. And then you mentioned the Medicaid block grants. Right now, you're guaranteed that if you have no money and you can't take care of yourself, you can't qualify for Medicaid and get either home health services at home or skilled nursing uh, facility uh, services uh, in, in a home. That would be gone with a block grant. With a block grant, there's a fixed amount of money, what and not everybody who people? needs it will get it. And what would happen to the people if they had that? Back to the on future. On their own. <laughs> on their own. Uh, Congressman Farr, California. Thank you very much for having this hearing on the eve of the debate. When you think about it, here we sit on a Tuesday, and five Tuesdays from now, we'll know who the next President of the United States will be, and whether Medicare as we know it will continue to be uh, expanded and used wisely, or whether it'll be done away with. It seems to me that um, those of us sitting here have got over 300 years of congressional experience time in 
you add it all up, and we've dealt with this issue, but for the first time what we're dealing with, and I like your term of fragmenting the system, it appears that what they want to do is break up this system, break up this ability to have a huge pool of people, as you said, 50 million people. I mean, you can really bargain with 50 million people. You can't bargain as an individual. And I'd like you to just explore a little bit, if we did, if we broke it up, um, Mr. Becerra said at the convention that there was a great term, a coupon care, of, of shifting the emphasis, and, and Don Edwards said it was uh, turning a patient into a shopper. Perhaps if we use the analogies in the marketplace that uh, Mr. Ryan's so fond of quoting, and talk about what about, this is like breaking up all the Costco's and all the discount centers and not having those anymore. And you just have to go to the, 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 the provider of the, of the piece and not have any ability to shop in, with, with a whole bunch of numbers and to, to bargain for rates. Could you just give us some analogies of what this would do if we break it up to the consumer, to the Medicare patient? Sure, and we've seen it in Part D where the law re re prohibits the secretary from negotiating on behalf of all Medicare beneficiaries. So instead of getting prices down like the 7 million member Veterans Administration, the almost 50 million member uh, Medicare prescription drug benefits have go uh, costs have gone up. It makes no sense. And I had this discussion many years ago with the uh, prior administration's CMS Medicare administrator. And I said, you know, everybody knows Walmart, there's an analogy, gets the prices down, like them or not, uh, the entity, because it shops on behalf of huge numbers of, of customers. And I was told, well, each plan's going to be able to negotiate, similar to each private plan in the voucher system. Well, they don't have the North Wyndham, Connecticut, Walmart negotiate and the uh, Silver Spring, Maryland, Walmart negotiate. They negotiate on behalf of all. It's, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist. This, uh, I'm no economist to understand that that's how you get prices down. And so we should m encourage encourage the traditional Medicare model at, we have in our testimony have, I have some exam, uh, recommendations and one of them is put a, a prescription drug benefit into the traditional Medicare program so that the one stop shopping is possible in traditional Medicare. It's no, it's not um, unintended that the, the last administration's bill put a prescription drug only into private plans. So you need to have the, the pool be as large as possible to bring down costs uh, for financial reasons as well as for uh, community reasons. And Walmart knows that and studies show that that would be true, that is true in the Medicare market as well. It doesn't, it, it doesn't do us any good to have each individual shop in the market. That's not the way to bring costs down. Congresswoman Jackson Lee. <coughs> This is such a moving and important hearing today, and I thank the chairs for gathering us. It is timely because there will be an important statement made tomorrow by two individuals seeking the presidency of the United States. Quickly, let me thank all the witnesses, and let me acknowledge the Rice University out of Houston, Texas graduate, and Dr. Davis, uh, and uh, appreciate her work. Let me quickly cite in the record that the Ryan budget, the Ryan Romney budget, gets 62% of its huge budget cuts from programs for lower income Americans, uh, the Center on Budget and Policy. I thought it was important to put uh, that statement uh, into the record. And that the voucher program, the premium program, support program, will leave many seniors uh, that are here today, or not here today, who you're speaking for, vulnerable. My late mother, who earned Medicare as others relied upon it as so many of my constituents do. So I have two uh, quick questions for you. And I would ask this question as I, as I lead into the questions. Listening to all the answers, I see a train wreck. What we avoided in 1965 or what we tried to avoid is the continuing train wreck of seniors along the highway of despair. And if you all would answer that at the same time, the question of raising the age 
oh, that looks like a good budget cutting item, but seniors are in different stages of health. They work differently, coal miners and others. And if you would ask, so the two questions, the age issue, the train wreck, and then to say what impact it would have on poor seniors. Uh, if I could start with Dr. Davis and then Stein and in the time that I have, and thank you very much. I want to stop the train wreck. Well, as a Rice alumna, I share your concern about uh, being on a train wreck. That's exactly where we were going uh, before Medicare was enacted in 1965. I think you're right that people are just hanging on until they can qualify for Medicare at age 65 now. Uh, we know that for people who are un uninsured before they become uh, age 65, they have chronic conditions that aren't well managed. Uh, they go on to Medicare sicker and, and more costly. Uh, the repeal of the Affordable Care Act would also affect those uh, near, near elderly uh, who now, uh, under the Affordable Care Act, would have some option for coverage. I'd like to just stress, when we talk about having this elderly person shop uh, for care, be cost conscious, 45% of Medicare beneficiaries have three or more chronic conditions, 29% have cognitive or mental impairments, 17% are disabled under age 65, uh, many of them uh, paralyzed, unable to get out of the home. These are the people we are asking to be cost conscious shoppers. These are the people who would be affected by these policies. I echo that. I also want to remind you of one more incredible statistic, and that is the Kaiser Family Foundation uh, tells us that 22, uh, about half of Medicare beneficiaries have an annual income of $22,000 a year. Mm. You know, I, I really do think that uh, that it's no wonder that the, the country thinks that Congress is out of touch with what's really happening in this world. It is a train wreck. And it wasn't, I wouldn't be here because we're a nonprofit and um, this is a democratic caucus, but it's not a, par it's not a political issue. Medicare is in jeopardy and it's for, it's for philosophical reasons, I believe. It's simply not the most cost effective way to do what is being proposed and it will absolutely put us back to where we were in 65 mm. and you cannot plan for it. It's a, it is a train wreck waiting, waiting to happen, and we have to get people to hear that. And yes, it's personal. I'm a breast cancer survivor. Mm -hmm. I know what it's <laughs> like to be perfectly healthy one day, and the next day to be maybe, maybe dying. How can you plan for this? And how can I plan to take care, know that I can take care of my mother, and maybe my children, and I too, have eight grandchildren. Of course, I got some of them by, by marriage, but I do have eight. This is a personal matter, it's a train wreck, and it's not best for people or for the fiscal solvency of this country. So why is it being proposed? Because there's a preference for privatization, and fragmenting and privatizing this system will not help older people, their families, disabled people, their families, or the deficit. So I'm, I'm on p all points with you, I'm very worried about it. Insurers cannot uh, deny people coverage for pre-existing conditions. Most seniors have pre-existing conditions. Won't they now be faced with the fact that, well, because you have a pre-existing condition, if you want, uh, uh, maybe your, your $7,000, whatever it is, voucher could buy this kind of policy. If you've got a pre-existing condition, so it's going to cost you $35,000. You know, that's really an excellent point. One of the reasons so many of these older adults, 60 to 64 years of age, are uninsured is they can't get health insurance at any price because they are denied coverage. Uh, we've done studies of people who've looked at the individual insurance market. Very few of them actually purchase it. Either they're denied coverage altogether or their condition is excluded or they're charged such an exorbitant premium. There's no way that they can, can afford it. Uh, Governor Romney has said he would deal with pre-existing conditions for people with continuous coverage. But 89 million Americans, according to our studies, have a gap in coverage over a two-year period, so they would have no ability to buy uh, coverage in the private market uh, as it exists today. And seniors under Medicare. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me recognize um, Mr. Clyburn for a question. Pass. Mr. Van Hollen for a question. 
our leader and the co-chairs and thank all of you for your testimony. Uh, you know, the fundamental choice that uh, Romney and Ryan make in their budget plan is to provide trillions of dollars of additional tax cuts to very wealthy Americans uh, at the expense of everyone and everything else, uh, at the expense of the middle class and the expense of seniors. Uh, we've talked about how they would do that in the out years uh, with the voucher plan, uh, transforming Medicare into voucher care or coupon care, uh, and essentially transferring all those rising health care costs onto the backs of seniors while they provide tax cuts uh, for very wealthy uh, individuals. But I, I want to emphasize, I want to ask you to emphasize the fact that it does negatively impact current seniors in very specific ways because Romney or Ryan are trying to suggest, well, it's not so bad 10 years from now, but you know, even if it's not great, uh, it's not impacting anybody today. And it's important to put some numbers on it. So if you're a senior that falls into the donut hole, it's gonna cost you another $1,800 a year on average over the next 10 years. Not starting 10 years from now, over the next 10 years. And if you're fortunate not to fall into the donut hole, uh, but you're a senior, uh, it's gonna cost you an estimated $360 on average per year over the next 10 years. As Ms. Stein pointed out, there's some people who may think that's not a lot, but if you have a median income of $22,000 a year and you're working hard to make ends meet, that is a lot. And what I'd like uh, Dr. Davis and others to do, if you could explain how it is that the Romney Ryan plan is transferring those additional costs onto seniors by restoring the overpayments to the private insurance companies, because I don't think seniors realize that they're going to be paying more immediately so that private insurance companies in Medicare can immediately get more. Uh, and it's very important that people recognize this. This is all seniors. If you could elaborate on that, please. Yes, the, uh, the Romney-Ryan proposal does repeal the Affordable Care Act, everything in the Affordable Care Act. So as you say, that's the improved coverage in the donut hole, elimination of the donut hole by 2020. It's the improved preventive services. But it also eliminates the overpayments to Medicare Advantage private plans, and it gives back to hospitals and doctors higher updates, inflationary increases um, that are in, uh, that are reduced by 1%, encouraging hospitals to improve productivity. As those are restored, the trust fund is exhausted in 2016, so that's bad for seniors instead of being secure until 2024. But I think the point was made earlier about premiums and out-of-pocket costs. As you go back and pay hospitals more, as you go back and pay nursing homes more, all of those costs get translated into cost sharing for beneficiaries, current beneficiaries, so that they would in fact pay more. Medicare Part B premiums would be higher as we pay home health agencies uh, more. So restoring uh, the very sensible uh, productivity improvement, um, uh, not giving hospitals as big a raise, not giving home health agencies as a big a raise, as those are restored, those are real costs that beneficiaries would pay. And the estimate based on the, the CMS, the nonpartisan CS, CMS numbers, is at $360 per year for seniors over the next uh, 10 years in order to restore those overpayments to insurance companies and others. Right. I think it's important to just make one point, and that is those cuts to the overpayments, overpayments to private plans are a good portion, though not all, of the famous $716 billion that Medicare beneficiaries are being told are being cut and I think it's extraordinarily important for them to understand that it's not in benefits, it's in overpayments to, to, to private Medicare plans. Can, can you just repeat that? Re, re, talk. Can we just have the 716 just for a second to talk about that 716 which we're being pilloried with as being a cut and exactly what that is? Well, as your colleague says, I, I really don't understand why that 14, apparent, approximately 14% payment to private plans in Medicare Advantage over and above what it would cost to provide the same care to a Medicare beneficiary in traditional Medicare. I don't see why we should pay one cent of that. To me, that's, that's waste and abuse. 
I'm not sure it's fraud, but it's certainly outrageous waste. And as a taxpayer and a lover of Medicare, <laughs> Uh, an advocate for the program, it, it appalls me. The $716 billion is approximately the figure that's cut, that's re reduced by reducing the payments to private Medicare plans, and as uh, Ms. Davis said, reducing the increases, not giving them, uh, not cutting them entirely, reducing the increases to providers and requiring that they be based on some quality indexing. So it's extraordinarily important that people understand these are not benefit cuts. They're wasteful overpayments that we should refuse to pay. Absolutely. I just underscore the $716 billion in Medicare savings over the decade uh, were not the result of cutting any benefit in Medicare. Uh, there are, in fact, improvements in benefits, uh, wellness visit, uh, re uh, elimination of cost sharing for preventive services, uh, elimination uh, phasing out of the, of the donut hole. There were no cuts in benefits. All of those savings came from eliminating waste and overpayments. And on the part of the hospital industry that offered to take a 1% increase reduction in their inflation update because covering the uninsured reduces their bad debts. So they could see that if you're going to cover the uninsured, they could live with a little bit less from Medicare. Thank you all very much. I'd like to now yield to, uh, to the leader, Madam Mayor. I want to thank our co-chairs, Congresswoman DeLauro and Congressman Miller, for their leadership in bringing so many of our members together. We're honored to have most of the House Democratic leadership here at this hearing, and it's a very important one. I want to also uh, thank uh, Karen Davis, Cheryl Davis, Daryl, uh, Judith Stein, and Dr. William uh, uh, Ben. We just call him Ben because he, uh, we all know, have become so familiar with him. And Ben points out what's so important in all of this. We hear the statistics. They are staggering. They are staggering. And since we're quoting uh, writers, uh, um, uh, George Bernard Shaw once said, a, a sign of a truly intelligent person is that he, he said he, but uh, he or she is uh, not uh, is swayed by statistics. These statistics are staggering, but what, what's important about them is what it means in the individual personal lives of the American people. And I thank Ben and Cheryl for coming to, uh, to point that out, because that is what this is about. It is, as you have all said, it is personal. Uh, what we have heard here today is very important about privatizing uh, being to the advantage of the private insurance companies about choice given to them and lowering the choice, uh, diminishing the choice of, of, uh, of beneficiaries to doctors and the rest. Uh, it's about um, the 17, $716 billion totally being misrepresented as to what it was. Not a cut, not one cent of a cut to beneficiaries, uh, but into the uh, decreasing the increase uh, that the private, uh, that the providers would would receive, and it's really important for American people to know this because they have a lot at risk. Congresswoman Jackson Lee described it as a train wreck. You identified with that. I just want to close by saying this. When I was very young, and you'll know how long ago this was when I tell you, President Kennedy, then Senator Kennedy, was campaigning for President of the United States. He came to Baltimore, and we had a sh there was a radio, sh a television show called Senator Kennedy Answers Your Question. And I had the privilege, my father was active in his campaign, of being one of the people, who, young women, who answered the phone when the calls came in. And I always remembered this because it was so clear. Every call was about when are we going to pass legislation to have health care for uh, health insurance for America's seniors. Every call. But these calls weren't all from seniors. They were from family members. They were from family members, but this, what, this was a staggering, speaking of the word staggering, need, an urgent need in our society to have economic and health security for America's seniors, and it made a tremendous difference. And what we see now today with repealing the Medicare guarantee is to take us back pre-Lyndon Johnson. Again, this was a, 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 an issue in the John F. Kennedy race in 1960. And they want to take us back to that place. And the sad part of it is the misrepresentations to seniors about what is risk. And I thank all of you for coming personally, officially, in every way to clear the air, uh, to present the facts, to insist on the truth. 
as to what is happening uh, with Medicare. If, and uh, not to talk politics, but Medicare is on the ballot. And Medicare is in jeopardy and Medicare is at risk. So at the very least, the American people need to know, need to know, and this is on a need to know basis, every possible ramification for them. Whether it's Medicaid as well, what that means to America's families, it means that granny is going to be sleeping in the living room with one of those adjustable beds if all of this is, is cut. They're coming home from the nursing home. And there's all the love, with all the love in the world, families have a responsibility to the next generation. And, and seniors would want their children to have responsibility to the next generation. Uh, so this is about seniors, yeah, but it's about America's families. And for that, I thank all of you for your very excellent testimony as to uh, the, as, uh, the ramifications, not just to seniors, uh, but to their children and to their grandchildren. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you uh, very much, Judy, and, and thank you, Karen. For, we're on a first-name basis here because this is very possible. And once again, I thank Congresswoman DeLauro and Congressman Miller for bringing us together today. Thank you all very much.